So yes, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I, I would obviously have preferred to do this physically in Tarragona, but you know you cannot have everything from life. But next time in person. Uh, next year, sure. Yes. So uh, let me tell you a bit about, about what I did after ISIC, because believe it or not, I had a life after ISIC. Uh, so after my first postdoc, I moved to Mind the Bite, which is where Melchor also worked. I was working as a business developer. And Mind Abide was a startup company selling a software as a service. I then moved from my second postdoc to the University of Bristol uh, to do some computational endemology with Mark, who is also listening. And I'm now currently doing my third and hopefully last postdoc in Pavia. Uh, I'm doing some biomolecular modeling with some medicinal chemistry. As my group, that's what my group specializes in. As you can see, I moved from materials to biomolecules. But what links most of my experience is that I, you can say I've been working for, with catalysts most of the time. I won't be telling you about cold calling customers. We can organize a different call um, for that. So in Bristol, I had the opportunity of working with Mark, uh, and it was a very, very fertile experience, scientifically speaking, because we had frequent contacts with Adrian Mulholland's group, who is also a very big name in the sector, and Mark is a very keen uh, computational enzymologist, and we were looking at studying the region and the stereoselectivity in this particular enzyme, which is actinorhodin reductase. And it is found in this soil bacterium, Streptomyces chelicolor. And as I was saying, it, it was a very good experience because uh, I was exposed to a lot of different case studies with people from different groups, uh, with, with people from the group studying different proteins. I learned a lot of biosimulation techniques, a lot of concepts that maybe weren't immediate from material science. And so it was really useful. Why were we interested in this enzyme? First of all, um, as a, from the biocatalytic point of view, it is renowned for uh, reducing small ketones, such as trans-1 decalone, to small alcohol, but in a stereoselective way. So introducing an RNS center, depending on the case. But also we are looking at, uh, sorry, yes. And so we were looking at um, how, you know, how the stereoselectivity changes with respect to specific mutations. But also we're interested from the natural point of view because what it does in nature, it takes a 16 carbon polyketide chain. It first of all does this very regioselective uh, cyclization at the C7, C12 position. And another keto reduction, which is also very regioselective and stereoselective, turning this into an alcohol. What this work gave me the opportunity of doing is to learn a general strategy to study reactivity in enzymes. So for example, in this case, because we are studying reductive hydride transfer from different planes, we have, we have different scenarios where the hydride transfer can occur from the pro-R side or the pro-S side. You compare these different scenarios within the enzyme by investigating three general factors. So first of all, we have to ask ourselves whether there are more frequent reactive poses in one situation or in another. And by reactive pose, I mean uh, a pose which is catalytically prone to form the product. So for example, the hydride would be presented from this side in the, in the pro-S case. So in this case, the pro-S would be more common than the pro-R. Second, we have to look at the substrate's binding affinity because maybe the substrate is simply happier to bind in one orientation compared to another. And that makes the difference. And I think the third, what applies to what maybe quantum chemists can relate to more, is whether there is, it, it is easier to reach the product in one situation compared to another situation. So, i.e., whether we have lower reaction barriers. Uh, so, in this case, it can be uh, either because the reactants are less stable or the transition state is made more stable or both, you know. But anyway, you can see that there might be a lower reaction barrier. So I was very happy working with Mark. Uh, then I decided that uh, I had to, the time had come to move back uh, home, uh, but I, I wanted to keep that experience that I had with Mark. So I changed the bridge. Um, I had met with Giorgio, um, who, uh, people working in his institute had given a talk in the University of Bristol. And I decided to, to go back, to move back with him and to apply the techniques that I studied with Mark. 
uh, to a completely different system, to a new system, to this big uh, beast here, uh, which is known as track one. And I, exactly, I was trying to apply the skills I learned in Bristol to study the peculiar, the peculiar reactivity of this chaperone, which is a target for allosteric modulators. So some fun facts uh, about this chaperone. It, it's a member of the wider chaperone family, HSP90 chaperone family, which is specific to mitochondria. Its task is to oversee the correct folding of other client proteins, it folds them correctly, and as you can see, it is intrinsically asymmetric with a backward protomer and a straight protomer. Now, the folding of the clients is driven by this remarkable conformational cycle going from open to closed, and at the center of this conformational cycle is ATP cleavage. Very curiously, the first ATP to cleave is always the one that is bound to the buckled protomer, and it has to be in the closed state. Only after the first hydrolysis happens, you have a flip of the protomers, the buckled becomes straight, and the straight becomes buckled. Only then can the second hydrolysis proceed in the new buckled protomer, and this triggers reopening and ATP release. Curiously, on its own, the system is a very lousy catalyst, so that the barrier, as you can see, is very high, even in the backward protomer, which is the one that is allowed to react. And the trick for it to function in vivo is the presence of uh, other co chaperone proteins, which bind to other places in the structure, and they are able to tune this barrier in such a way that either they lower it or they raise it even more. And consequently, they are able to accelerate or uh, slow down the conformational cycle. Not surprisingly, it's found that the co-chaperones and the track one itself has, have dramatically altered expression levels in a series of cancer. And this makes uh, track one an ideal therapeutic target. Uh, we can, of course, design orthosteric inhibitors for, for TRAP1, but the problem, such as radicical, but the problem is that obviously these compete directly with the ATP in the binding site, and this means that they're extremely indiscriminate. You have uh, entire chaperone shutdown, and this also leads to toxicity issues. A much more desirable alternative, therefore, are allosteric ligands, um, because they behave in a similar way to co-chaperones. They are milder and they are much more uh, subtle tuners of the conformational site. So they are more selective because in these areas away from the active site, chaperones are different, etc. So we want to hunt for these. They also can act as client degraders because they can impede direct or directly or indirectly by changing the cycle or by blocking interfaces, they can impede client folding. And so maybe a carcinogenic protein can be inhibited. When I reached the Colombo lab, there was already uh, a successful recipe in place to study, the, to, to, to develop the design of allosteric modulators. So you would first do molecular dynamics of the structures to identify inter-residue crustal roots um, reaching the active sites. Uh, can you see my mouse, by the way, my pointer? Si, si. Okay, okay. okay. So... Um, yeah, so they would identify these cross talk roots, and they would then identify cryptic pockets in the structure involving those side chains, uh, over the side chains initiating the cross talk. And through pharmacophore based design, they would then screen online libraries of, of compounds in search for potential allosteric modulators. But why weren't we satisfied with this? The thing is that at the chemical level, some key questions remain about the reactivity. So we, we don't really, we can assume which active site residues are the ones that are receiving the prostoc signals, but we don't know exactly the, 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 the chemistry of this, and especially why it, the, the first hydrolysis is so obliged to happen in the buckled protomer as opposed to the straight protomer. So ultimately, we would want to develop a model, an atomistic model, that links this very peculiar asymmetry to the peculiar reactivity. And of course, by reactivity, I mean the usual three Bristol factors, so to speak. So the percentage of reactive poses, the binding energy, and the energy barrier. 
so before we even so finally we can move on to doing some chemistry and before we even start setting up our model we need to ask ourselves whether there are immediate glaring differences in any of the three factors um, in the active side of the two protomers. The first glance, if you see them superimposed, it wouldn't seem so. So both have a very superimposable ATP and a magnesium cation. There is a nucleophilic water sitting there. There is the glutamate 115, which could be acting as the base. And the only vague source of difference is the presence of this tyrosine 106 and this tyrosinic water, which is hydrogen bound, that is slightly more open in the back of protein. We don't know whether this difference is meaningful at all, uh, so, so we have to set off to hunt what, what else could be making the buckled protomer more reactive than the straight. So I investigated the problem using a similar strategy uh, as in Bristol with Mark. This time, however, we are not comparing chirality scenarios and mutation scenarios, but we are simply comparing asymmetry scenarios. So the three factors were compared, first of all, in terms of asymmetry, buckled versus straight. We then decoupled the tightness of the sequestration by hydrogen bond of this nucleophile. We, we sorted it out into tight sequestration versus loose sequestration. And the other thing that we attempted to discriminate is the type of chemical mechanism. So we contrasted the enzyme assisted mechanism in which the glutamate is acting as the base and you have uh, phosphate transfer, or the substrate assisted mechanism in which it is this oxygen from the ATP that is acting as the base. And this was complicating our lives a little because in reality experimental evidence is strongly indicative of the enzyme assisted sub um, pathway. But I like complicating my life. So, so um, going on to comparing factor one, so the proportion of reactive poses such as this, where catalytic distances are prone to start forming the products. These, you simply probe them via very normal classical molecular dynamic simulations. So uh, we do this in Amber. I cried a lot when I had to leave um, Bromax, but Amber is equally good for biosimulation. So uh, you do a lot of independent replicas and you simply count the proportion of reactive poses in your active sites. In terms of the second factor, which is the free energy of binding, um, I don't want to spend too much time into this. We check the binding affinity of our ATP uh, in one protomer or in the other. It, out of the many options that are available to test this problem, I chose to study it with water swap which is a technique developed in Bristol, and uh, it, it just requires normal amber input. And what happens, using this coupled reaction coordinate lambda from zero to one, you gradually switch your substrates parameters, slowly morphing them into the parameters of a sphere of water of an equal volume. And you measure how the binding, uh, so how the free energy um, changes. But as I said, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this because this didn't really give us any difference between the scenarios. In terms of free energy, uh, we are obviously have to compare the barriers for hydrolysis in the different scenarios. And this is typically done with semi-empirical QMMM dynamics with umbrella sampling. It is again done in amber. And you have got to do so for at least 10 to 12 individual reactive snapshots for each of the scenarios you're testing, which is why we had to do 120 runs in total. You do this with velocities extracted from the classical simulation. And of course, you have to, uh, you have to choose, you have to define a QM region, a proper QM region. Yeah. And, um, and you have to do so in, in, a, in, a, in a chemically smart way. So, <laughs> You would typically include the. You. you would typically include the hydrogen bond. And um, you, you would include the. You have to have capping hydrogens, but you, you normally include the, the residues that are chemically important. Uh, what happens in umbrella sampling, you, you define your reaction coordinates, uh, the enzyme and substrate assisted by, by these distances that I show, and you typically simulate them in small windows, in increments, 
0 0.1 angstrom increments uh, that you simulate in a restrained fashion for two picoseconds each, so each windows, until the system is gradually completely reacted and, and, reached, and has reached the product. So for example, with one random uh, enzyme-assisted snapshot, you can see this is an example of umbrella sampling. Funnily enough, you have the, this loose metaphosphate-like transition state first, and then the proton jumps to the glutamate after the, the phosphate transfer. I will play it again. Yeah, so you see, and there is the phosphate transfer and then the proton jumps late. But you, your system has fully reacted. Uh, I have used the taboo word for most computational chemists, uh, so sorry, for most quantum chemists, which is semi-empirical. And sadly, we, we have to choose this sort of less accurate approach because it is the, when, when we're using these big numbers, it is the only possible approach due to its lower computational cost. However, of course, this means that we have to benchmark the chosen approach with higher level DFT cluster models. And this is what I mean by a cluster model. Uh, you typically excite a portion of the active site from a snapshot and you optimize it freezing these atoms in implicit solvent with, uh, with, with a DFT functional. And it's a very boring step, but it's a necessary step. So you need to, for example, look at energetic aspects. So you need to see whether profiles are similar, uh, energetic profiles to the ones given by EFT. And you've got to check whether barriers are typically over or underestimated. And obviously you're also benchmarking from a structural point of view. So you are comparing the two situations and you're looking at chemical aspects. For example, we can see here that encouragingly the enzyme assisted route has predicts this planar transition state in both cases. Uh, it's a metaphosphate, a loose metaphosphate like transition state. So we are happy-ish. We have to remember that ultimately we're never going to have precise correspondence between the two methods. We're ultimately interested in qualitative trends, in changes in the reaction barriers between the scenarios. So let's see the results for the reactive poses. Remember, before we go in the actual counts, remember we have this specific discriminant here, the tightness of this nucleophilic sequestration. And the reason why we choose this, I'm going to show, is that it turns out that it's not an artifact of the crystal structure. You can see that the difference in distribution persists during the molecular dynamic simulations. We have an excess of tighter sequestration in the straight protomer and an excess of loose sequestration in the buckled protomer, which is very encouraging as we want. So now if we incorporate this in the scenario of asymmetry, so if this is included, this criterion in the count of reactive poses, we can see that there is a clear excess along both reaction mechanisms, but if we exclude this threshold, it is still persist there is still a persistence of excess reactive poses in the buckled protomer for the enzyme-assisted um, pathway. So this half of the graph shows excess reactivity in the buckled protomer. The situation changes for the substrate-assisted, um, but it's not important as we will see. Looking at the compared reaction barriers, I will show you these are the 120 individual umbrella sampling runs. We can merge them into single profiles and I can zoom in on a uh, region, on, on an identically scaled region close to the transition state. We can merge the graphs and you can see that in any case, all of the four substrate assisted scenarios are higher in energy. So we can comfortably rule them out. We are excluded from the reaction. And if we still assess them by the different tightness of the nucleophilic sequestration, we can see that the looser sequestration, no matter in what protomer it occurs, is enough to lower the reaction barrier for hydrolysis. Whereas the tighter sequestration is enough to raise it. So in summary, the approach from Bristol and the approaches that I learned in Bristol from Ma with Mark, uh, I, I used them to model this poor asymmetric catalyst, track one. And we saw as per experiment that in the buckled protomer, the nucleophile tends to be less sequestered by this couple of, uh, by this coupled formed by the tyrosine and the water tyrosine. And this event on its own, when it happens, because it's more frequent in the buckled protomer, 
it happens more often in the buccal protomer, but no matter in what protomer it happens is enough to lower the energetic barrier for the hydrolysis. And these two events combined, we believe, are the reason why the buccal protomer is slightly more reactive than the straight. Of course, the future steps are to see whether this model works with the allosteric ligands that we have already. So whether inhibitors inhibit and activators activate. And the other step is to use the, the model to design new ligands with more intelligent approaches. So I know I have probably run out of time. I will just show you very quickly what we are trying to do with the SARS-CoV-2 protein variants. Uh, we are comparing with an in-house algorithm potential immunogenic regions um, and how they change across the most popular variants. We are, we are doing very long molecular dynamic simulations to investigate this. Of course, I would personally like to do uh, QMMM on viral enzymes, but you know, everyone is throwing everything they have at these systems. And for example, Iñaki Tuñón is using the Barcelona Supercomputing Center to do his investigation. So probably it's not worthwhile. And with this, I have finished. Uh, I should thank Mark and thank him especially, uh, thank him especially for attending. Uh, and my group in Pavia, so Giorgio, um, Elisabetta and Maria uh, did some background simulations for my uh, track one work. And Alice is a very smart PhD student who is working uh, on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, project. It's part of the PhD. And thank you for listening. Bravo, Stefano. Thank you very much. Very nice talk and congrats for the nice results. Thank you. Yes, let's hope that then it will be publishable if we are having some problems. And you went time, eh? almost on time, so wonderful. Ah, okay. Thank you. I, <laughs> I, I didn't speak too fast because that's of course what happened to us. So the room is open for yeah. questions. Be, be shy because I'm very embarrassed about questions. So I, 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 I'm, I thank you very much for allowing uh, me to uh, to come to your seminar as well. That was uh, that's very nice. So um, as there is no other questions, could could I ask a uh, um, a quick question to Stefano? And it's not please. A, yeah, not a complicated one. So I was I was wondering with your track one work, now that you've established uh, the the catalytic difference between the tight and the loose sequestration. I guess now you can just only use molecular dynamic simulations to assess the effect of the allosteric inhibitors because then you only have to look at whether it's tight or loose. Is that yes. yeah, yeah? Yes, indeed. This is this is the this is the idea because yeah, it's it's simple and um, because the, coupled with the algorithm to identify the crosstalk routes. Which, are, which is anyway derivable by normal molecular dynamics, you would definitely investigate what repercussions a ligand would have on that tyrosine, and you would hopefully know straight away. Yeah. Uh, in, incidentally, the, the, the tyrosine is, biological, is biologically significant because we can see it's conserved in eukaryotes, and also uh, in related chaperones, uh, you can see that in the crystal structures, it moves quite a lot. So depending on how it's being, you can see it's one of the switches. There are many switches in that active site, but it is one of the switches that can introduce. So. Next. Come on. Well, a technical, a technical is your question. Huh? Uh, microsecond scale molecular dynamics. These are very long simulations. Yes. It should be very, very expensive and produce huge files. Yes. Could you give us some uh, assessments of the numbers? Yeah. Spot on. Uh, at, so I, w I wish I remember the amount in gigabytes, but, but as you say, in, in, in terms of, so, and you saw not only what you said that the simulations are very, you're talking about the SARS COVID protein. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only are the simulations very long, but the system is massive, especially with the glycan shield. And we are not even uh, simulating the whole protein because uh, I will reshare the screen. Now, 
Oops. So we, there is the, all the transmembrane part that we are omitting. Share, yeah, share the screen. Yeah. You there is, so underneath, can you see it? Yes. Underneath here, there is a very, very long transmembrane domain that we are omitting. And so it, we are even simplifying the problem. But as Mark will know, like in San Diego, where they have the, uh, I can't never remember the, the, the supercomputer that they have, they have been studying it in full. And, and, and so we are, we, in Pavia are collaborating with ENI, which is the Italian equivalent of Repso, and they have a very big supercomputer. And even so, with uh -huh. acceleration in Amber, etc. Oh yeah, in fact, I should have put it's a collaboration with ENI for legal reasons. Thanks for asking. Um, the, it, it lasts more or less a month. Month. A month, if not more, yes. And we have to break the replicas in 10 parts uh, because, because, uh, for wall time reasons and stuff like that. So it's very, very long. In storage, maybe uh, tens of tens to 100 gigabytes per run, depending on how many frames you save. I remember that uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, when we started the lockdown, yeah, and we didn't know what to do, no? we were talking with the group. Huh? And I, I remember Alba, Alba is there. Or Alba. Because Alba, in, in her master thesis, uh, uh, she did studies, uh, similar studies uh, uh, regarding proton transfer in enzymes. Yeah? So she, had, she has experience in uh, molecular dynamic simulations and so on. She was motivated to try to do something with uh, the spike protein. Yeah? And, uh, just for curiosity, we started looking at the structures when they became, some of them became available and we saw so complex and uh, so is. big and without having the experience we have in the group, it was, uh, it was not worth uh, to, to go. Hey, Alba? It, it is a, a nightmare and also, as I said, like, you will know Rami Amaro, Mark knows Rami Amaro in, in San Diego, all the big beasts are, even in Bristol, even in Bristol, actually, the, the, the guys did, did stuff. And, and it, it, as you say, they, they have a lot of computational resources and it was a big problem. It, it, it's especially complicated for the glycan shield, like solving the glycan shield. Like we only did it, we, we, we took the data from uh, guys in, Geor in the University of Georgia in, in Atlanta who, who specialize in this kind of things. In itself, it wasn't an easy task. And, and obviously the glycan shield is very important because it's what allows the protein to escape the antibodies. So, yeah, act yeah. Act actually, what we decided to do for COVID was to, to give some of our computers to the folding at home uh, project. Yeah, and, uh, and Martin yeah, installed the uh, the demons and uh, and yeah, there are. I think still there are some jobs that are running in our in some nodes of our cluster, huh? okay. contributing to the collaborative effort yeah, in solving this and solve our problem uh, because the problem the problem yeah, is yeah. really. No, but it, in, yeah. in, in our case, we just wanted to see whether our in-house algorithm uh, that we know works for the system it was a suited um, occasion to apply it into this system. But apart from that, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we knew that like pe people have been able to actually see, they have doing su been doing such long and, and well-tempered uh, MD simulations that they have been able to see the flip of the RB of the receptor binding domain. So when you, when you are faced with that sort of discovery, you know, you, you, as you something. say. Something, something. More questions, comments? Hey, come on. So, oh, um, if I may, no, no. you presented several what seemed to me like potential energy surfaces, right? So, uh, along the reaction path, yeah. So, you, you do independent simulations to, to get at each of the conformations to, that lead to the... Um, to the reaction products? Yes, which, which ones do you mean? So these ones... So 
Yeah, the, the, the final ones. Okay, yeah, sorry, one second. Are you present? This. Yeah, these charts, yeah. 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 Yes, so, so they are started from an individual snap. Yes, so these are 120 individual snapshots that you take from the classical molecular dynamics. And you, you define them as being reactive as per these criteria. So it's not always an easy task. To, it's, it's, a, it's a bit uh, person. So you have to use some chemical intuition, but it's not a clear cut task defining what is reactive and what is unreactive. You have to try different combinations. But once you have established a fair criteria or what you think is a fair criterion, you then, yes, you isolate a minimum number of snapshots per scenario. Even this is a matter of personal choice what constitutes a statistically valid number, and you sample each one of them individually with umbrella sampling. So, it's, it's, so it's presumably you can arrive at a, an estimation of the rate constant, right? Yes, this is so yes and no, in the sense that it, it is possible and the people in Bristol have been doing that, but you are at so, if you want to do that sort of study, because semi-empirical is nowhere near uh, as appreciated, you, you, you are at the crossroads. So you can do that sort of study, but then you have to start reducing the number of barriers you sample and repeat the sampling with very, very much higher uh, level methods, even post SCF methods. And then that can be done, yes. You, okay. you can still attempt to relate through transition state theory, the barriers that you have calculated, for example, in the FT to the rate constant. But when you do, you can do this, when you do this, you have to absolutely stress that it's qualitative and there are all these caveats. But, but it's definitely uh, possible if you want to do that sort of study. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Some more question, comment? No? So Stefano, it seems there are no more questions. Okay, good. <laughs> and you stop sharing the screen? So I we see stop sharing the screen. Interrompi. There we go. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, really, uh, really nice. Thank you, you, thank you to you, Stefano. It has been a pleasure to see you again uh, and to learn the nice things you are doing. Yeah. yeah, and thanks to, well, I mean, I'm glad that Mark is here, so I don't have to tell him afterwards. Me too. Nice. Him a lot. <laughs> nice, nice to meet Mark. I uh, hope to meet elsewhere very soon, physically, hopefully in Tarragona, maybe, yeah. Yeah, and Stefano, for next year, we organize a calzotada for sure. Yeah. Right? We will, you will be invited, in, of course, yeah. Thank you very much. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, we can go with uh, the Nat Natalie Faye, who is also a common friend to both of you, and uh, Maria yeah. Bess, how we can organize. Oh, yes, of course. Big, a big party next year. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much. Okay, so uh, good luck, uh, and uh, take care, and thanks again. Thank you very much, guys. See you. Adios. See you. Adeo. Adeo, adeo. Adeo, adeo a todos.